Hello, welcome again to Cooking by the Books. I am Stellan Harris, your host as always. We are joined by a special guest, our usual helpers on here today. Today we are joined by Matthew Swearingen of the Mocktails and Cocktails program here at the library. Say hello, Matt. Hello, hello everyone. Matt, Matt's gonna be on, on the ones too, but Matt's also gonna be doing a demonstration because Matt's got a bit of expertise in some things that I don't. So Matt's gonna give us a bit of a lesson, but I'm gonna go ahead and start our presentation. Give me just a moment, folks. Beautiful. So, as I mentioned, this is Cooking by the Book, the Marvelous Meal Prep Edition. As you know, Cooking by the Book is a DBRL culinary program. We're going to teach you some culinary skills. We'll cover desserts, entrees, budget meals, and fancier fare to impress your guests. Today is going to be a bit of a budget meal, a budget focused meal. It's not, all, it's not entirely budget. You can prep things that are fancier, but we'll get into it. Don't worry. But today, as I mentioned, as I hinted that, we're going to be talking about meal prep. We're going to give you some tips on making a meal plan. We're going to talk about containers. We're going to talk about how to get started. And we're going to show you some recipes that you can use in your very own home to prep your very own meals and reduce all that time spent cooking during the week. But I hear you asking, what is meal prep? I assume you know, but we're going to go through this for all the folks who may not be familiar with all the intricacies of meal prep. So meal prep at its core is preparing your meals in advance. Uh, it can take a lot of different forms, and it typically does vary from person to person. What you prep and how you prep is going to be different based on your budget, based on your how much activity you do, based on your work schedule, based on other commitments. It's going to vary a lot based on person to person. When you start, though, it's it can be kind of overwhelming, if I'm honest. The idea of, okay, I'm going to set up a day, and I'm going to cook every single meal. I'm going to eat through the week. It'll be done. I don't have to worry about it. That's a lot of work, and that can be very overwhelming to some folks. Some folks knock it out of the park and they can nail it, no problem. Others, it's a bit more difficult. But the key is to not get discouraged. We have some things that might be able to help you get a bit on that track. Some basic things you want to do at the start, this is a very basic process. It is not going to always look like this for everyone, but this is some a place to get started. Some basic steps you want to do it. Some basic steps you want to take are deciding what meals you want to prep. You, this can take the form of a menu or just a list of recipes you want to cook. It, again, it varies. You'll find those recipes. Uh, bonus points if you can get recipes that freeze well. We'll talk more about freezing later. But find things that you want to cook and that you want to eat and that you won't mind eating this week. You don't. You won't always prep the same things on a week to week basis. You might not prep the same thing week to week ever based on your preferences. But you want to find those recipes, you want to decide how you'll store your meals, because what you cook will often decide how you store it. If something is easily freezable or doesn't really store well past a few days, that'll change how you prep it. After you've made those decisions, you'll shop for the ingredients and you'll do the cooking. Generally, in my experience, folks like to set aside like a day. I do mine on Sunday. Sunday is, is a popular time to set aside to do that if you're not busy otherwise. But you'll set aside that time, do the cooking, portion everything out, and you'll have your meal prep. And that's all meal prep is. And again, this is more of a template. It's kind of a place to get started. So don't feel like if this doesn't work for you one-to-one, -one, that you can't meal prep. You certainly can. Because there are different kinds of meal prep, and this is not an exhaustive list. This is something that I, I sort of put together in my experience. I've talked to folks who like to meal prep a lot. And some common concerns that folks have are, I don't I like to eat the same thing for a week, or I don't have time to do all this. And you can adjust meal prepping to work for you, because that is, of course, the point. It should work for you and your schedule. Now, some folks do the full meal prep, which is you sit aside a couple hours, you cook your breakfast, lunch, dinners, and snacks. Everything is portioned out. It's all done. You don't have to worry about it, you don't have to worry about it at all throughout the rest of the week. You might heat something up, but that's about it. For some folks, that works. For some folks, that is a great way to regiment, the, regiment what they eat and make sure they're getting all the good nutrients in, that they need throughout the week. For other folks, it can be a bit difficult because that's a lot of upfront time investment and it doesn't work for all schedules. Another thing that you can do that I've seen folks do to great effect, especially for those who can't eat the same thing constantly, is do what I'm going to call a mix and match prep, which is cooking a variety of ingredients which can then assemble into different meals. You might do a protein, 
a carb, some vegetables, a salad, and you can mix those into maybe maybe on Monday it's a wrap, maybe on maybe on Tuesday it's like a, like a fried rice kind of thing, maybe it's a sandwich, maybe it has a different sauce on 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 Wednesday and Thursday, maybe Wednesday's curry, Thursday's barbecue, maybe you have a big salad on on, on Friday, anything like that. The proteins, the carbs, that composition is up to you. Really, you just want to prep things in the mix and match that you want to eat. And you want to include some variety to make it not as kind of boring as it might otherwise be. Another way you can do this is the prep, raw, and freeze, which is get all, around, all the ingredients done, cut everything, cut everything done, put it in a bag or cut it in and freeze it. And then next week, you can pull it out, pop it in a pan, and it's all good to go. No, no fuss, no muss. The last thing I'm going to point out is big batch cooking, which is a, a cousin to the full meal prep, which is you will cook a lot of food. And when I say a lot, I don't mean just the week. You'll cook maybe for a month. You'll cook maybe for two weeks. You'll cook something that is easily scaled up and that you can use in a lot of different ways to make it so you don't have to do as much, much cooking in the far future. But these are, of course, just ideas. They don't have to fit one-to-one. -one. I don't always do any of these things. I do, don't always fit into these small molds. But... We're gonna cut. Uh, we're gonna cut on this theory when we get into a more practical, hands-on example. And this is why I brought the the master Matt's range engine because we're gonna talk about our first sheet pan dinner. Matt, do you, you make a lot of sheet pan dinners? I do. Uh, I I make quite a few different sheet pan dinners. Um, I, in large part because um, my wife and I both work full time, and we now have a seven month old daughter. So we we like to you know, we like to cook, but we also like to not spend all night cooking after yep. we get home from work after working all day. Mm -hmm. So the sheep in there is great for if you have things like a work schedule and a, a, a new child <laughs> that needs that time. So this sheep in there is very simple, and I've listed the ingredients here. Uh, Matt is going to go through the process of putting this together. We've done some of the child beforehand, but I'm going to actually. Give Matt, give the floor to Matt so he can show us this process. This is something Matt's made before. Thank you, Stella. Oh, Thank you for having me here today. It's my a, pleasure. A pleasure to demonstrate this recipe. Um, as Stella said, I have made this recipe a couple of times recently. It has turned out well um, every time we've had it. Um, one one little thing just to note about sheet pan meals and the reason I like them is they they are really easy to to make in advance. You can do a lot of your prep work beforehand, and then as we have here with the the vegetables already already chopped, you don't have to do this right before you put it in the oven. You can have it done the day or two before, and then just put everything in your sheet pan and then pop it in the oven. Um, another thing I like about sheet pan meals is how they are very customizable. You can you can. If you find something you like, you can use different vegetables in it. You can use a different protein. You can really adapt any recipe to fit your particular tastes. Um, or you can take advantage of um, what produce is in season in your area and really stock up on those things and make a lot of different sheet pan meals. Um, so don't feel constrained by what the recipe says. You know, do whatever you enjoy eating and I, I promise you, it's going to be easy. It's going to be good, and you are going to have a a new a new entry in your your personal cookbook. Mm -hmm. So for this for this particular sheet pan dinner, I'm actually going to grab. Oh, oh yes, our gloves. Safety Go first, folks. <laughs> we always don't, always safety first. Don't want to handle raw meat and touch that's cross contamination. That's not in our business here. Get on some gloves and handle that raw meat safely. Gloves. So what kind of meat do we have there, Matt? Today we are working with sweet Italian sausage. Um, this works, I, I've made this recipe with um, sweet Italian sausage before. I personally love spicy Italian sausage. I think this would work well with that um, type of sausage as well. You could I think this particular recipe is very simple. You could do really any kind of sausage. Um, one of my favorite sheet pan meals is a similar blend of vegetables. Um, maybe add in some broccoli because I, I love broccoli and mm. it's a great way to, to cook it, but with some smoked sausage Ooh. and just toss that in there. 
I, I think that I actually had that for dinner on Monday <laughs> this week. And um, yeah, it's always a favorite in, in my household. So for this meal, and, and just for folks at home, we are scaling down our recipe because while you have lovely large ovens at home, we are working out of a toaster oven today. We are going to use about three of these sausages. Lay them on your pan here. That's a, that's a aluminum foil pan. Yes, it is. Um, the pan has been covered with aluminum foil, which if you if you use when you're using a regular sheet pan, I happen to have a nonstick pan, so that makes cleanup very easy. Um, but if you don't have a nonstick sheet pan, line it with parchment paper or aluminum foil. That makes cleanup even easier, mm -hmm. and you, because it is a one one dish meal, you don't have a lot of pots and pans to clean up afterward. It it really can't get any simpler. <laughs> so you lay out your few. Now I've gone and touched oh, the boy. container with my meat covered gloves. That's all right. It's 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 been caught earlier. <laughs> So now that we have laid out our sausages on the pan, take our pre-chopped vegetables. And, and what vegetables are those, Matt? We have red bell pepper, some red onion, zucchini, and That's that looks like it. We 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 did some some experimenting, folks at home. We, we I did a, a batch with potatoes, which worked okay. There was some issues with potatoes didn't cook as quickly as everything else, but it is something that if you adjust it, and you, if you if you want to take the extra step, and this kind of this is I know it's a lot. You want to maybe cook those potatoes a bit beforehand, like put them in a little bit early, early, and then everything else that might work. But for this, we're going to be this we're going to make this as simple as possible. So it's just that blend of vegetables. And they've been coated in a little or tossed in a little olive oil or mm -hmm. oil of some kind mm -hmm. and a little salt and pepper to taste. And just add these veggies to your pan, arrange them around the sausages. Some of the peppers are going to escape. <laughs> it's cost doing business. Lose a few peppers. <laughs> so we've got this pan pretty well full here. Uh, now, Matt, is it okay if some of the vegetables cover those peppers? It is. It is okay. Um, I, when I make this, I, I fill my pan probably more full than I should, <laughs> but it always turns out. Everything ends up cooking well. Um, I wouldn't cover you know, the, the sausages completely, but having a little bit on top is, is okay. You don't have to have everything uncovered. Hmm. Um. Open up our, our, our oven and step around. And I should slide right in that top room. Slide that in there. Close that lid. And we're going to cook this for approximately 25 minutes. Um, it is that the sheet pan meals that I, I like to make have that 20 to 25 minute cook time. Um, and every once in a while, I might, depending on how, I'm, I'm kind of lazy when it comes to chopping vegetables, so I tend to make them a little bigger, mm. which can increase the cook time a little bit. Um, but I also don't mind some, some crisp peppers <laughs> um, in, in a sheet pan meal. Tidy up my runaway peppers here. There we go. And that is the Italian sausage sheet pan dinner. Yeah. And we will come back to that in approximately 25 minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. I, I, I had not made this before. When I spoke, Matt, I asked Matt to be on this program, and I asked for an idea. He pointed this out to me, and I thought it was such a fun idea and such a cool way to have a dinner that is done in under an hour, generally, that you can customize to your needs. But as this cooks, we're going to talk a bit more about meal prep generally, because now that we have this, this lovely sheet pan dinner, what do we do with it? How do we how do we store it? How do we make this a process? And meal prep is at its heart a process. I'm also going to share the recipe again 
this is a full scale recipe that this this is what you would do at home uh if you if you don't if you don't have the spur oil like i didn't you just coat your stuff in oil i just put a little in a, in a bowl tossed everything to coat all that good stuff do like 25 maybe 30 minutes if things are taking a little bit if you do potatoes i would say definitely go 30 if not more and like check them for doneness maybe put those potatoes in like five minutes before everything else but mess around with it see how you see how you like to do it but we'll come back if it's time and sheet dinner in a minute so mm -hmm. I thought about doing some more and I wanted to share with you some some key tips to getting started because I've definitely I've tried meal prepping consistently a couple times and there are times when I ran at it full steam and I hit a wall and I got discouraged it's very easy to do so so here's some tips to make it a bit easy for yourself and the first tip is of course make it easy for yourself the point of meal prepping is to make things convenient if you have easy meals within reach you're not going to say get culvers at 9 30 p.m after working a night and you don't really want to cook anything like i did last night because i didn't have any meal prep ready if i had i would have come home and eaten that instead and saved myself like 10 bucks and the thing about making it easy is that what is easy for one person will be easy for you if using an oven is too much you have to with a microwave don't have a microwave you have salads or sandwiches or any kind of, any other kind of cold meals i i'm going to prep a cold breakfast for it for you guys in a minute and that's just something that I will make occasionally so I get something to eat in the morning that keeps me going to lunch. But you want to make this process as easy for yourself as possible so you'll have that consistency. The next tip is to give yourself some leeway. We are not perfect. I am not perfect. I won't speak for Matt, but I am definitely not perfect. But there's going to be days when you do end up eating that cold at 9 30 p.m. because sometimes you just need that. And that's okay. Meal prep doesn't have to be this regimented, strict thing. It's there to help and make things easier, but everyone's going to have a surprise lunch. Maybe a, maybe a family wants to have lunch with you. Maybe there's an office party or something like that, and there's food brought in. That doesn't have to totally wreck all the meal prep you've done. If you give yourself some leeway and I'll say, okay, so I'm not going to eat this lunch today. Can I freeze it? Can I have it for dinner? Can I shift things down so we have an extra meal on the weekend? Like There are ways to make meal prep not as a cut and dry thing that I think will help folks do it more consistently. The next one, and we'll get into this a bit, is think about how you store your meals. Excuse me. Um, because storing your meals is going to affect the way you interact with them, for, for lack of better words. If you have everything in a big Tupperware all mixed together, it might be harder to portion that out and to eat a meal in, say, five meals instead of uh, three. I've done that before. I've made a big batch of something and then I've eaten it, not really portioned out. And that's made it hard to keep that portion, that portion control so that I, it stretches the length of time I need it to stretch. You don't always need to have the super fancy containers. We'll talk about the containers in a bit, but think about how you want to portion those meals. And to Matt's, to Matt's focus on sheep and dinners, he mentioned cutting those vegetables beforehand. That's a great way to package something and store it feature. If you want, if you have, say, I don't, a Tupperware or even a plastic bag that you could that you could pop your vegetables in, maybe even also the sausages in there so you can get rid of that little styrofoam guy. Anything like that would work. And that's thinking about storing to help make this process easier for you. This next one, and that was one I think is crucial, uh, freeze what you won't eat. Now, not everything freezes. I'm well aware. We've all frozen things that didn't quite make it out to the other side. But when you're thinking about your recipes, try and think about if something might do well in the freezer. And if so, maybe consider using that to store it in a more, in a longer term setting. Because the freezer can be a really powerful ally when you're making meals, because not everything will hold up for five days in the fridge, but some things might hold up quite a bit longer in the freezer. And then as you go, you can eat your lunch one day, the night before, take, that, take a meal out of the freezer, thaw it, it'll be good to go. And then last but not least is shop with a plan. I, I and many of us are guilty of going to the store with an idea in our heads of what we'll buy and then coming out with things that maybe you didn't plan to and they might end up fine. But when you're meal prepping, it helps a lot to go in with your recipes in mind. If you make a grocery list, have it focused around your meal prep, figure out what you need for that. Make sure you don't duplicate things. I've definitely bought two bags of flour. I think I didn't have any bags of flour. 
It happens to the best of us, but that can be avoided by shopping with a plan, having those lists, making sure you're focused on what you're buying. And if you buy an extra, an extra thing, it's not the end of the world. Because again, give yourself some leeway, it'll happen occasionally. Now, I want to talk about meal prep containers. Meal prep containers are a hot button issue, in my experience. Folks have very strong opinions about meal prep containers. Uh, pictured here are three of what I will call the most common types of containers. I didn't put Tupperware. Tupperware will fall under the plastic containers category, but the three big ones I've seen are the glass meal prep, the glass meal prep containers, plastic ones, and then these deli containers. Each of these have their own pros and cons. It's One is not the best. Uh, it really just depends on what you want to do. So the glass containers are, of course, very sturdy if you get good ones. Uh, they're also, they look nice. If there's a certain aesthetic to having a nice, colorful, delicious meal in a glass container, you can see it. Uh, they're also pretty microwavable, which not all plastic containers, some will warp over time if you microwave them repeatedly. But on the downside of glass is that glass meal prep containers are by far the most expensive. And they're good quality, but the, if you're looking to get a full set, for maybe breakfast, lunch, dinner, that's gonna cost you a bit of an upfront investment that isn't always as present with the other kinds of containers. And also it might be a bit self-explanatory, but uh, glass will shatter occasionally. Whether you, you bump it off a counter, whether, whether it's something that gets shifted in, in your backpack, anything like that glass can break in ways that plastic won't as easily. Also, if you don't get good glass containers, some aren't heat rated, so you could have that in a board situation where you'll pour maybe a hot soup into a container, it'll sit for a minute and then it'll explode. Uh, I haven't had that happen, but I've seen tales of folks who have, and it's none too pleasant. But that is not to say that glass doesn't have a place. It of course does. Another option is the plastic containers. Plastic containers are, they're lightweight, they're cheap. They generally don't stain as, as easily uh, because they're generally of darker color. They can also stack pretty well. But unfortunately the, the plastic containers can be a bit flimsy if you buy ones that aren't particularly well, well made, which can lead to kind of a similar problem to the glass. They don't break as easily, but they do wear and tear a lot easier than glass does, especially the lids. Uh, I, I was talking with a coworker the other day about these containers, and she mentioned that over time, after like a couple washes in the dishwasher on occasion, like the lids don't snap as easily. And you want your lids to be pretty secure on a meal container. If you're eating, say, a soup or any kind of saucy dish, you don't want to open your lunchbox or your bag to find that your phone and your keys are also sauced. That, that's not a fun time. The last option is one that I use quite a bit are these deli containers. Now, this is not one I see as often, but it's something I, I think you should think about because these containers are modular. They come in a couple of different sizes. I generally see them in eight ounce, 16 ounce, and 32 ounce uh, of various sizes. They are, for my money, probably the cheapest option if you're looking for a, an entryway meal prep kind of equipment uh, because you get a lot of them for pretty cheap. You can get packs of like 20 for under $20 and they don't take up a lot of space because they all collapse into each other very efficiently. You can use them for a lot of stuff. You don't have these in meal as well. I use them to store whole spices or snacks or things like that. They do various functions better than the other containers do because of varied size and their ease of use. Uh, downsides of these, though, is, of course, uh, lid management is even more important because without these, without lids, these become a bit of a hassle. And the lids aren't always easy to clean. Uh, if you get something up in the rim of the lid, it can be very difficult to get that out. You get to manually scrub it. Dishwashers don't do as well with these. So you often have to wash the lids by hand just because it, it doesn't work as well. But they are, of course, also easily stained because they're clear. If you're eating a lot of pasta with like red sauce or curry or any kind of Mexican foods, uh, you're going to have to spend some more time cleaning those because otherwise you'll have some lovely partially orange deli containers. But we have our we have our sausage cooked, so we're going to do a breakfast now. And this breakfast is going to take, uh, I'll say, three minutes if that. So we're going to do an overnight oats. Overnight oats is basically an oatmeal that is mixed together ahead of time. It sets in your fridge overnight and then it is delicious in the morning. Our overnight oats is going to be, this is a template 
our template, which you can scale up or down or swap out as you like, is half cup rolled oats, specifically rolled oats. Don't use quick oats. Don't, I wouldn't use steel cut either. They're different kinds of oats. Rolled oats are going to be your best bet for the best texture. But half cup oats, half cup milk, quarter cup yogurt, or more milk if you're, if you're not into that kind of tangy flavor. Uh, but a, a two, one, two, one to two teaspoons, at most a tablespoon of sweetener, that can be sugar, that can be honey, that can be, be maple syrup. We use maple syrup. A pinch of salt, maybe uh, optionally, a bit of vanilla extract, depending on the flavor profile you want. Sometimes you want something that tastes a little bit baked goody. And then lastly, your toppings, which can be anything from fresh berries to chocolate chips, to peanut butter, to coconut. I've seen chia seeds in there. There's all kinds of stuff. And the recipe itself is quite literally put everything into a container, let it soak for three to four hours or overnight and enjoy hot or cold. We're gonna use blueberries today, but it is really, the world is your oyster. So I'm gonna literally do this in front of you. This is a mixture of almond milk and Greek yogurt with a with about a tablespoon of maple syrup and a, a splash of vanilla extract. I'm just gonna, this is half cup rolled oats. That goes in there, we're gonna mix. And you just want to mix this until it is pretty homogenous. Uh, we mixed the yogurt and the milk separately because if you don't, it can be a bit difficult to get that to, it can be a bit difficult to get that to be homogenous. And you want that, you want that, that tangy yogurty kind of flavor. Also adds a bit more protein to it, which helps with satiety. I guess I can say that. I don't really know. I've only heard, I've only seen it spelled. I, don't, I haven't heard it said much, but it doesn't really matter. And then last, we have some blueberries. These are just fresh blueberries. They don't have to be fresh. Frozen would work just fine. I'm just going to put these in here a whole. And they will sit a handful and a half. This is probably not exactly a quarter cup, but I like more blueberries in mine. And this is my oatmeal, so that's how we'll do things. <laughs> and then just get this in the mix. And that, this, is, this is done. How long was that? That was on about five minutes, yeah. if that. And a lot of that was me, took me yapping, so. This will now sit in my fridge overnight or for a couple hours, and then I'll have breakfast. I'll go over here, and whoa, what's this? The magic of time. What? I have an oatmeal right here. I made this last night. And this is actually a double batch, so I can eat this for two breakfasts if, if I want. And it was quite literally as easy as that. Let me grab, let me grab, grab a fork so I can actually try this. But it's super simple. It's an easy way to prep meals in advance. As the oats soak, they do become oatmeal in texture. It's kind of magical. I don't really understand it myself, but it does make for a delicious breakfast that is quick and cheap and simple. Oatmeal is a historical breakfast for a reason. Oats help keep you full of it better than other things might. And that extra protein from the yogurt will also help with that. Matt, do you, uh, you, Matt, uh, do you eat much oatmeal? I, I go through phases yeah. where I eat oatmeal a few times a week for breakfast, mm -hmm. and then I don't touch the oats for <laughs> a month. Yeah. And fortunately, they keep well. They do. So I, I don't have to then buy another container of oats. Um, you mentioned in the recipe that you could enjoy this um, hot or cold. Yes. Have you had it both ways? I have, yes. Which do you prefer? Personally, I prefer it cold. Okay. Because I feel like it, I like, if you eat it cold, it kind of does take on a bit of a more pudding-like consistency. Okay. Uh, that I think I enjoy more cold. If you do warm it up, it 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 has the consistency of oatmeal. Like it, it it it's it's still thick, it's still delicious. It's just purely a matter of preference. Also, part my preference could also because I enjoy putting fresh fruit in mine, and I generally like my fresh fruit cold. Yeah. So that kind of contributes to that. But I've had it both ways. I've done a I did I did a, a peanut butter overnight oats with with like chocolate chips in it. I had that warm and the chips kind of melted. It was yeah. it was delicious. That sounds like dessert. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's like dessert. Place. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I I can't sing the praises of overnight oats more. It's and it's super simple. It's super cheap. That was that was barely an ingredient, and the oats keep forever. I'm gonna have oats for quite a long time that I'm not gonna go through anytime soon. So it's something I highly recommend to folks if you're just looking for a quick breakfast. That's that. That's our breakfast done. Matt, what's our time on our on our dinner? We have nine minutes and twenty seconds. Perfect. B E A beautiful. So we're gonna head back in because I'm gonna yap about oats some more. Can you tell I like oatmeal, folks? I don't know if it's become obvious yet. 
but I will once again sing the praises of the overnight oats because I really want to really hammer home how custom how customizable these oats are. As I said, you can do all kinds of flavor profiles. If you want to change things up, you could say add chia seeds. Well, that's an addition I see recommended quite often. Do like a tablespoon of chia seeds when you put in the oats. They will also they will give it an even more pudding like consistency. If you've ever had like chia seed pudding, it has a similar effect in here. One thing I did for a long time was do like if you have protein powder, do like a scoop of that in there that really amps up that protein content really. So you got the, the double whammy of oats keep you full, protein keeps you full, you're good for most of the day. It is something I highly recommend, but really you can customize it to your tastes. If you don't like blueberries, do cherries, strawberries, uh, kiwi, anything like that. There's all kinds of fruits you can do. Don't do fruits, do a jam. If you, if you, if you want to do a jam or anything like that, these oats can, they, they can take it all. They're, they're good for it. This is a template for you to use for your benefit. And for your benefit, it's super easy. You, you literally saw me do all the steps almost. The thing you didn't see me do was mix together milk and yogurt. And that's, that's quite literally just mixing. It's very simple. This is something that you could do if you, if you had small children, that they can help with. Kids, kids love helping out in the kitchen. It's something that you could have your, your small child do, assuming they can mix things. It might, might be a bit of a risky risk proposition, but maybe with an eye on them. But it's something that you consider doing because if it's easy enough for a kid to do, I think even you after after working all day, coming home, you can whip this together in no problem. And then one thing that I didn't realize for a long time is how shelf stable overnight oats are. And I don't mean like oats. I mean like this thing of oats will last, it'll last in the fridge for like five days, which I think is wild considering that it's mostly dairy. But it'll, it'll keep for most weeks. So what you can do is if you make a batch of these on, say, Monday, that's your breakfast for the, the entire work week. And that's it done. So that is definitely a benefit to think about if, you, if you're not convinced of the power of the overnight oats. This is something to think about. And something I would recommend folks, just give a try. I know what I'm doing on Sunday nights. <laughs> All right. So... Last, but certainly not least, we have we have breakfast. Dinner's in the oven. What about lunch? Well, don't you worry, folks, because I've, I've pulled a trick on you. Lunch has been here the whole time. It's been right, right in front of your eyes. We're having the salsa crock pot chicken. Now, some of you may be familiar with this recipe. It's a recipe that is near and dear to my heart. I ate this for most of college because I had a crock pot and not much else. And so the beauty of the salsa crock pot chicken is is multifaceted. The salsa crock the salsa crock pot chicken is quite literally two pounds of boneless chicken. You can use breasts or thighs. Use, use what you have. We used breasts today. It's a jar of your favorite salsa. It's going to be about two cups. And the rest of this is pretty optional, but I think it helps amp it up a bit. An onion sliced into strips, two peppers into strips. Optionally, two teaspoons of taco seasoning. If you don't, if you if you don't like taco seasoning, that's fine. You could replace it with some cumin, some all, all those good spices. The taco seasoning does have the benefit of adding salt and adding a thickener, so that so that you your end product isn't as saucy. It's a bit more more together, more incorporated, but purely personal preference. Then salt for its taste, and if you want to get fancy with it, want to really feel like you're you're you're, you're eating at the five star restaurant, a little lime wedge on there, a little, a little lime wedge to serve with it, add some acid to it. So that tropical flavor. And Matt, how do you make salsa crock pot chicken? I always use uh, taco seasoning. Mm -hmm. but, um, I, I use a little bit more. I use a full packet or oh, yeah. the equivalent. Um, we have a, a blend that we like to buy Ooh. that I just measure out maybe. Um, I use a, a tablespoon or two. Um, and yeah, that's. Matt likes the seasons. I do. I like, <laughs> I like my, my food. I like my food season well. <laughs> <laughs> well. But Matt, what's I mean, this delicious lunch? It's got to be hard to make. You, you got to do a lot with it, I'm sure. No, you you really don't. You you put everything into your your crock pot or slow cooker, uh -huh. and you turn it on. Well, what else? That's it. That is it. That's it. That's quite literally it, folks. Then you wait three to four hours on high or six to eight on low, and then you shred the chicken. And if you want some less sauce, maybe. You, that last hour, leave the lid off. It'll dry out a little bit. You have a bit of a different texture to it, less, less saucy. And 
what do you do with salsa carbonara chicken? I hear you ask. Well, you can have it in tacos, nachos, burritos, enchiladas, quesadillas, casseroles, soups, salads, pizzas, paninis, dips, dumplings, and more. There's so many applications because this is, at its base, a seasoned protein. Remember back at the start when I mentioned the mix and match meal prep? This is a perfect encapsulation of that, is that you can make a big batch of this and cook it in a hundred things and each of it be different. As I mentioned, this is something that I did. Uh, in fact, earlier today, when I got in here at nine, I went over to the crock pot at work. Yes, I brought it. Yes, there's a crock pot at work. Don't ask questions. Um, and I said, okay. So I put my chicken in here and I turned it on, checked it about lunchtime, and it's entirely done. I did not, I didn't have to do anything. I was at work when this happened, quite literally. I grab a fork and get some anything to show you exactly what we're working on. So it is still pretty soupy, but again, if you don't like that, mix it up a bit, maybe reduce that slightly. And now we have a lovely, slightly red chicken that tastes of salsa. And this made quite a bit, this was just a pack of chicken breasts, more like three, three pounds. So slightly more, but totally fine. Look at that, delicious. I'll get the close to the camera, show you quite a bit. It's, it's, might not be as as photogenic as some, but it is delicious. And this is a good amount. I, I considered like making a quesadilla live on live on this program, but I felt like that would over overstay my point because you can do so much with this. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be explicitly tacos. I you could see this in a soup would be lovely because all it is it's, it's a, a seasoned protein, and that's something that you can use in so many different things. Matt, what's we talking about? We are at two minutes and 15 oh, seconds. Look, look how we timed that, folks. Two <laughs> minutes. It's almost like we planned it. So we are going to do a little bit of cleanup here. Move all this stuff out, out of the way. And really the point of all this programming, and this program specifically, is to show you guys that meal prep doesn't have to be hard. Uh, it often can seem that way, but meal prep at its core is meant to be easy for you. And we hope that we can make things as easy for you as possible. Uh, but, and one thing we can do to make it a bit easier is recommend some reading materials. That's right. It's the Cooking by the Books book recommendation. So I did. I had a think, and I pulled out some books that I would recommend for folks who are really curious and want to get started with meal prepping. The first one I'll recommend is Ultimate Meal Prep by America's Test Kitchen. I have so much faith in America's Test Kitchen. They put out amazing content. They do all kinds of things and they give so much insightful commentary on cooking. This is a great place to start if you want to get into it. It is aimed at folks who don't really have a lot of background in it, so it really helps with this. The second book I'll recommend is Freezer to Table. This one is focused on that relationship between meal prepping and freezing things. So if you don't really have an idea of what meals might freeze well, then this is a great resource to consult. And also, as a bonus, that book, local author. There's actually an interview with that author and, and her co-author on the DVRL adult blog. If you go looking for that, I'm sure you can find it. But that is something I highly recommend you guys check out and the book as well. And the last one is a new title, which is Prep and Rally. And this one I, I have not tried myself because it's a new title, but it's something that I think is very interesting because it purports to meal prep in an hour. And that is very good if true. If, if, if this book will help you get meal prep done in an hour or less, that is a huge time saver. I don't do it an hour. It takes me a couple hours, generally. So if, if this book helps you get it into about an hour about an hour of the time, that is an amazing resource to consult. So I would, and you can, and of course, you can find all these books at the Denver Regional Library, because I, I would not show the book that you couldn't find here. I, I will make you buy a book now, what I know, you can add your local library, because as the saying goes, having fun is not hard when you have a library card. All right, but based on my internal my internal clock, I think we're getting close to that timer, aren't we? Done. Beautiful. So, what we're going to do is I'm going to get out of share screen mode, and we're going to grab something so I can take out that hot pan and don't burn up my hands. This has been cooking in real time, folks. You've seen this get cooked. It's been roasting away. Oh, oh, that smell. Amazing. Oh, yeah. 
but sausages are brown. The vegetables have gotten nice and cooked. Hey, anyway, let's let's show let's show the people folks at home. Ooh, look at that! Look at that! Beautiful. That beautiful sheet pan dinner. And that took all of 25 minutes. Oven off. We're good to go. So we have, of course, breakfast, <laughs> lunch, and dinner all done. All ready for you. You can you can box that up. You can you can eat it in a bun, eat it over rice. There's all kinds of things. One thing I've done with this in my test run is you take the sausages after they cool just slightly, you, you chop them on like a diagonal and like toss everything in that delicious seasoned sort of like sausage, sausage grease. Not the healthiest thing, but <laughs> it is delicious. And what we're dealing with sausages, not even the healthiest thing, but that kind of seasons all the vegetables as well. It cuts down on the, on the salt you need to add. And I think it makes a delicious dinner. But this is what we're doing, folks. So we're going to go ahead and start to wrap it up. I want to thank Matt Swarnton again for joining me on this one. This has yeah, been my pleasure, Sal. Thanks for having me. Of course. This has been, this has been lovely. So... I want to thank you guys for joining us uh, on another episode of Cooking by the Book. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the program. Now you've learned some new tricks to try in your own kitchen. The recording of this will be on our YouTube channel in the near future, and we hope that you'll join us for future sessions. I, of course, as always, have been Stellan Harris, your host. I have been joined by Matt Sarangin. Matt, again, thank you. This has been lovely. We will have to have you back in the future at some point. Yeah, anytime. But all right. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.